What a blessing it is to have such a great praise team that leads us and just brings us to the throne. I'm serious. I, I guarantee you it's just such a joy to be able to minister after people who are so passionate about what they do and, uh, and lead us in such great ways. I, I know a lot of times uh, we just really don't know how to appreciate that unless you've been uh, around quite a bit. And uh, of course, I, I have. Uh, I know I, I look pretty young, but, uh, but I have, uh, I've been around. <laughs> I used to work a little, didn't it, Bill? Yeah, I did, used to work a little bit. Uh, it, it doesn't work too, too much anymore. But, uh, but anyway, I have been around a lot and been in a lot of places, been in a lot of churches, a lot of, a lot of other services and uh, spiritual services in life. And I'm just telling you that you don't always have such a blessing as we have and enjoy. And God's been good to us and he blesses us. And uh, those guys can do anything and they do and they just really bless our lives. And boy, that's just something. We've been uh, dealing, last week we took a Sunday off because of Father's Day and uh, I shared with you a, a message on They Call Me Daddy. And hopefully that has had some impact and matters to you and especially in dealing with, uh, with your children and with family. Very important issues, very important things in life. But we took a little Sunday off from a series that we've been in called Handling Life's Hurts. And in Handling Life's Hurts, uh, I've been trying to let the Word of God uh, and the Spirit of God shape some of our thoughts about how to handle the, the hurts that come in life. Uh, how many of you have ever been hurt in life? Let me, just, let me just make sure I'm talking to the right bunch. I know that's kind of really... A, that's one of those questions you don't really even have to ask, do you? Because if your heart's beating, you've been hurt in life. And um, the possibility and the, uh, the distinct probability is you're going to be hurt in life again. Because uh, as long as human beings on this earth, we have a tendency somehow to hurt each other. And we have all kinds of things that happen in our life. And, and we've dealt with uh, rejection and how to handle that, and anger, and disappointment, and uh, the storms of life, and then when your children grow beyond your control, we've looked at some of that, and we started looking uh, in, in a passage, well, really a story out of the scripture, about Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and for those of you that have been in church very much in your life, you're familiar with these people, because they were a big part of Jesus' life. Mary and Martha uh, took care of uh, of much of the being a hostess around the city of Bethany. Jesus went there many times. Martha always cooked, always prepared. Uh, they had meetings, all kind of meetings in the home. Mary was the worshiper, and she was just really very dedicated to Christ. And then Lazarus was their brother. And uh, the most famous thing that Lazarus did, of course, was die. Uh, no, it's, you know, he, you remember, Lazarus died, and, and uh, Martha sent word to Jesus that her brother was really sick, and Jesus hung around a couple of days where he was. He didn't immediately go, and uh, he wanted to wait until Lazarus obviously had passed away, and he knew he was going to die. And, and then he came and, uh, and raised Lazarus from the dead in a very supernatural, miraculous way that everybody knows about now. I put, uh, I, I've said to you that uh, I had on some slides on that particular message uh, a list of all the earthly miracles that Jesus did, uh, the ones that are recorded. You know, the Gospel of John says if everything Jesus did while he was on earth was recorded, that the whole world couldn't contain the volumes of all that Jesus did. But, but there were miracles that were recorded that Jesus did. And, and just to give you an idea of, uh, of where the raising of Lazarus would have occurred, uh, the raising of Lazarus would have occurred as the 34th miracle that Jesus did. Now, Jesus had already done, uh, I mean, he had walked on water, he had healed the sick, he had cast demons out, he had uh, raised uh, blinded eyes, he had even raised the dead, you know. And, and so uh, with Lazarus, if, if, if Jesus had just come down there immediately when Martha called and said, my brother's sick, he would have come down there, he would have had compassion on Lazarus and his good friends, and he would have most likely uh, either raised Lazarus immediately or he would never have died. And, and it would have just been another miracle that Jesus did. They already had seen miracles like this before. But of course, when he came down and Lazarus had been dead four days and he was in the tomb and, and, and everybody said, man, he stinks by now. You know, uh, he's dead, 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 dead. You know, he's not just dead, he's dead, dead, dead. And and so Jesus performed this wonderful miracle and said to everybody there that uh, this shows that I'm the resurrection and the life. 
And this is just a preview of everybody who knows me and their resurrection from the dead, which it was a symbol. It was, it was a Jesus showing us what we could expect if we believe in him and put our confidence and trust. So it was really a, a, a tremendous miracle about the resurrection and the life. So anyway, in, in this story, uh, I've been dealing with uh, the, the same type of hurt that happens in life uh, that I have just call frustration. You know, we get frustrated with others. And we dealt with that uh, where, Jesus, where Martha's frustrated with Mary and she complains to Jesus about her sister not helping her. Blah. And, and so we dealt with that. And then we dealt with the fact that sometimes you can get frustrated with God. And the reason you can get frustrated with God is because God doesn't always act like you think he ought to act. And he doesn't always do things like you think it ought to be done. And many times when God is at work in great ways, you're not even recognizing that the fact that God's at work because he's not doing it like you're thinking that it's going to be done because God has a different priority and God has a different perspective about life than we do. And so when we get frustrated with God many times, it's just the fact that we need to Think about the fact that God has a different perspective than we do. God sees things in a different way, and his priority is different from ours. We're very selfish and self-centered and self-focused, and we want things done when we want it, how we want it, and you know, right now on top of everything. And, and so we're dealing with frustration. There's one other little, little part of frustration I want to deal with today uh, in connection with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It's one of those things that it just kind of is a subtle little thing, and it might not be anything that you really have to deal with a lot in life, but I wanted to, I wanted to just run it by since we're in the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and just kind of give you a, a little bit of thought about how to, handle, uh, how to handle frustration when, when others are disappointed in you. Now, I know that you get disappointed in others, and, 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 and I know that you get disappointed in God, but there are lots of times that others get disappointed in us, and we feel that disappointment. We feel that frustration. And many times, and, and if, I, don't want to raise, I don't want you to raise your hands because I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but sometimes we're controlled by these expectations of others. I mean, our whole lives end up revolving around what other people expect from us. Yeah. And our lives are controlled, what we do, where we go, how long we stay, what we think, how we feel. Uh, the ebb and flow of our life is controlled by what others uh, expect us to do in life, and, and, uh, and we don't want to disappoint them, you know? And so that's a very controlling factor in our life, and there are a lot of people that have uh, lots of issues and family issues and marital issues and other kind of issues in life because they're just controlled by what others expect. Now, I would like to believe that once you hear, hear what the Scripture has to say about this, that it would be settled and you would never again have trouble being controlled by the expectations of others. But uh, maybe that won't happen. But, but there will be a couple of things here that I think will be important uh, for us to see and hear uh, concerning, concerning what others expect from us. Now, this happens in an event, and it's in John 12. And I'm just going to read the uh, first 11 verses or so, and then we'll come back. Uh, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived and uh, whom he had raised from the dead. Very important little, little, little insert there, by the way. Uh, before, you, before we even get started in anything, uh, John wants us to know how significant Jesus is. And he just reminds us, even as we're just getting started in the information, that, uh, that Jesus did raise Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus is a worthy uh, Lord, he's worthy to be worshipped and praised and adored and honored and so forth. And John wants you to know that by telling you, hey, you remember Jesus did raise Lazarus from the dead. There they made a supper in Jesus' honor, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Just so you'll know, uh, it was common in the day, and, and I know you, some of you have seen pictures of the Lord's Supper and other things like that, and you've noticed that around the table... Uh, the men would lean. They, they, would, they would lean, and they usually leaned on their left side facing the table. 
And it wasn't, they didn't sit up in chairs like these and have, you know, the nice table. And I mean, it was a different kind of a culture and an environment. And so it was quite common for uh, the men while they were eating to actually, you know, pretty much be laying down on their side with their, with their faces toward the table. And so that's the way it was. Lazarus was leaning at the table along with other guys, a lot of other important men there, a lot of disciples, a lot of spiritual guys there. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, betray Jesus, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, leave her alone. She has kept this day, this for the day of my burial. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you will not have always, which is a tremendous statement made by Jesus, by the way, uh, in connection with what's really important in life and the timing of things in life. We know that we'll always have poor people with us, right? Because that's just one of the common plights of life. And Jesus said, uh, you know, there'll always be a time to minister to the poor, but I'm not going to always be with you. And so Mary's done a good thing, and she's done it while she could because I'm not going to always be here. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. So here's Lazarus. Lazarus a rock star now, you know. I mean, think about it. If you had been raised from the dead, you'd been four days in a tomb, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes and, and, and speaks your name. And I know that many of you have said this to me. You said, hey, Pastor, you remember. And, and it is true that if had, had Jesus just said, come forth, uh, likely the whole cemetery would have come forth. But he speaks Lazarus' name. He says, Lazarus. And so Lazarus comes, you know, coming out. Of, he bursts out of the tomb. And, and, and Jesus says, all right, unwrap him, you know, because he evidently comes out all wrapped up in the linen. He's just kind of floating out of the tomb, you know. And I mean, you can imagine what kind of event this would be in the life of people. I mean, it would even be really tremendously supernatural and world famous now, much less in, in, in this day. And so everybody's wanting not only to see Jesus who did this miracle, but uh, Lazarus now, you know, is probably signing some autographs. I mean, he's a rock star. You know, he's the guy that got, he got, got raised from the dead. And so they're wanting to see Lazarus too. And then verse 10, but the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also. Now, isn't this amazing? And why? Because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Now, I'm just thinking, and you know, maybe, maybe this is not true, but I'm just thinking that it, wasn't, it wouldn't really be much of a, of a threat to threaten Lazarus with death. I mean, I'm just thinking this. I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, Lazarus, we're going to kill you if you don't quit uh, testifying and bringing these Jews to, to Jesus and believing in him. And I'm thinking Lazarus will say, well, I've been dead once. I mean, say, what? it's not that big of a deal, guys, I'll tell you. But, but anyway, so they want to, you know, there's a plot to put Lazarus to death and everybody's all uh, wrapped up with what's going on with Lazarus and, and, uh, and Jesus. And, and, uh, and in the middle of all of this big event, where all these religious dignitaries are, all of these spiritual guys, all of this uh, religious crowd, uh, Mary chooses to intrude herself into this meeting uh, in a very inappropriate way for the day. And I, and I know for us, you, probably, you may not even think this because in our day, you know, we have meetings and women and men move in and out. But in this day, just remember now, we're in in the biblical days, and women are just not, uh, they just don't intrude into an event where all the men are, and they're worshiping, and they're, you know, they're uh, uh, religiousizing, and they're, and they're all uh, uh, spiritual, and they're in their, uh, their form of their, you know, of their, of all this religiosity, and all this great importance, and circumstance, and all of this, and all of a sudden, Mary just burst into the room, uninvited, unannounced, totally out of, you know, out of character for, for this day and then just starts performing this tremendous worshipful act on Jesus right there in front of everybody. 
uninvited. Uh, nobody, I mean, this was unexpected, and it was uh, tremendously extravagant in life. And so they began, she gets criticized about this. Uh, the expectations of everybody were interfered with. You know, frustration comes, and I've said this to you, when your expectations don't match your experience. That's what brings frustration on in life. And so all of these people that are in this room with her, and especially one by the name of Judas, feels that what Mary has done has been uh, tremendously uh, inappropriate, and they are disappointed, and he is disappointed in this situation, and he brings uh, this tremendous criticism out against Mary. Now, before, before I get into a couple of little small points about how to handle it when people criticize you, especially in the area of doing things for Christ, which is what this is about. Uh, I want to I give you just a, about three thoughts about, about uh, meeting people's expectations and being criticized when you, when, you, when you don't meet them. Because the reason I'm doing this is because when we begin in just a moment looking at the passage and we get to see the two principles about being criticized for the things that you do for the Lord, you will have a tendency to identify yourself with Mary immediately and, and everybody that criticizes you for anything is going to be Judas. You know, Mary is innocent. She just comes in and, and, and gives her best to Jesus and she's completely passionate about what she's doing, and she does this tremendously extravagant, worshipful act on Jesus, uh, of which no one should criticize her. But, of course, Judas does. And so when, when we deal with messages like this and points like this, principles like this, many times uh, a message like this can become an excuse for people. And I don't want this to become an excuse where you can excuse yourself for everything, for everything in your life that people seem to criticize you about as if somehow you're always Mary, you're always innocent, and they're always Judas. They're, they're inappropriately criticizing you because there are many times, what I'm getting to is that there are many times when we are criticized for something that we need to be criticized about. That every criticism that somebody levels against our life is not a Mary and Judas kind of deal where we really don't deserve to be criticized and they're just evil as they can be for even saying anything about it. No, sometimes uh, the criticism is just, and I just want to bring about three little, uh, little points and, then, and we'll, then we'll move on. Here's the first one. It's not always the unreasonable expectations of others that cause frustration. Sometimes it's your performance. The reason I say this is because we live in, in a society today that just has an aversion to responsibility. Uh, nobody, when's the last time you heard anybody get fired from a job and say to you, you know, I really deserve to be fired. You know, really, I, I, I just, I, I wasn't doing my job. Um, I didn't show up on time. I had a bad attitude. I didn't really work. I took too long from a lunch hour. I mean, really, guys, you know, really, uh, I, I, really deserve, I, I really deserve to be fired off of that job. You, no, you don't hear that, do you? You hear everything. You hear, you hear, well, I got, why'd you get fired off your job? Well, I'm telling you, my boss, man, he just expects too much. He just expects way too much. Well, what does he expect? He expects me to work while I'm there all the time. <laughs> He expects me to have a good attitude. He expects me to dress right. He expects me to come back from lunch. You know, I mean, he is just unreasonable in his expectations for my life. No. I'm going to tell you what would give you a really good attitude check about this thing of, uh, of, uh, of responsibility for your performance. Uh, hire a couple of people. Hire a couple of people. That'll do it for you. I mean, really, you need, I, I mean, if you hire one, you might, hire, you might just accidentally hire somebody that's great. You know, I mean, they, they may be your brother or your cousin or some kin to you or something. They're going to they're gonna be the best employee that you've ever seen in the world. But hire about two or three others, you know, that, like that, and, and you'll get the idea. Uh, if they even show up on time, that'll be a minor miracle right there. 
And then if they show up and they actually have some tools with them that they're supposed to actually work with, that you actually hired them to do the job and work with, then that'll be another miracle. If they don't spend about half of their time on the cell phone talking to somebody that keeps calling them a girlfriend, a wife, or somebody else, and nobody ever understands how long they talk on a cell phone. I'm going to tell you, they'll talk on that thing for 15 minutes out of every hour. And then if they smoke, they always got to have a smoke break. So that's going to take about another, uh, I mean, you guys that smoke, I know you don't probably think about this, but you, it takes a long time, about 15 minutes roughly by the time you amble out there and by the time you find stuff and you fire it up and you just take time and you're talking on the cell phone and you got that thing. And then by the time you get back, it's about 20 minutes and you do that about once every hour all day long. How, many, how much time is that? I mean, sometimes it's not someone else's unreasonable expectations about you. It is the fact that you are not performing like you have been designed to perform in life. And so many times we're criticized justly because we just don't do what we're supposed to do. I've heard people say, well, they don't appreciate me down there on that job. Well, you get a paycheck, don't you? When you get a paycheck, that paycheck says, I appreciate you for what you do because I'm actually paying you for something that I've hired you to do. I mean, we don't go to work to be appreciated. We go to work to make money to support our family, right? Well, nobody's my friend. Well, do you go to work to find a friend? You go to work to make money to support your family? Come to church to find a friend, you know? Get out in the community and find a friend. But it's really a performance thing. And so many times, I mean, just uh, when people begin to criticize, don't always say, well, they have unreasonable expectations. No, sometimes it's just you. You are not performing. They have a right to expect you to do what they hired you to do. All right, let me move on. I don't uh, I see all of you kind of getting mad at me. All right, here's the second one. Sometimes you can't live up to the expectations of others because you're not any good at what you're trying to do. I mean, am I right about this? I mean, it, look, everybody can't do everything, right? I mean, you, you're not good at some things, right? The reason you're not good is probably because you don't care about it. And if you don't care about it, you're not motivated to get any better at it because you don't really want to be doing it in the first place. And so it's not your, I mean, this is not something for you. Uh, admit it and move on, you know, with life because we're not always good at everything. I mean, some of your children are not good at sports. Now, I know you want them to be, and, and I know you're trying to help them be, and you're sacrificing your time, but, I mean, just over and over and over, you're getting frustrated and angry and agitated and annoyed and, and, and hostile about things, and you're just complaining, and, right? And and, and bless their, their heart, you know, they're just not good at sports. That's not their propensity. They're good at other things. Maybe they're good on computers, or maybe they like adventure, or maybe, you know, you know they're the best shopper at them all in the whole history of the world, but, they're, uh, but, but, but they don't know how to hit a, a baseball or a softball or throw or catch, and they don't seem to be getting any better. And the reason why is because they don't care about it, and it's just something they don't want to do, and so they're not going to get better. So many times in life, we need to just face the fact that we're getting criticized for something that we're not good at, and we're not good at it because we don't want to be good at it, because we don't care about it. All right, number three. Sometimes overcommitment in lesser areas leads to frustration in greater areas. Uh, I've heard people... <laughs> I've heard people, men say, and women, I'm sure you say the same kind of thing. Uh, I've heard men say, my wife is just not satisfied with anything I do. You know why? Because you're giving her the scraps. You say, I know, I, she's criticized, she's, she's upset because I'm not making it. You know why, she, you know why you're not making it? Because you're not making it. Yeah, the reason you feel that way is because you're not making it. You know why? Because you're giving her the scraps. And by the scraps, I mean you're so committed in other areas of life that by the time you get home, you don't have anything left to give. And you're committed to all of these other areas in life, and you're doing a great job in all these other areas of life, and people are just exclaiming about how wonderful you are and how uh, great all of your work is and so forth. But by the time you get home, there is... 
there's nothing left to give her in life. So you are overcommitted in things that don't matter as much as the things you need to be committed to when you get home. And that's just an example. It could be anything else like that. But, but what I'm saying is that in order to not be uh, failing in the greater areas of life, the most important areas of life, it's not a spiritual thing. It's a practical thing. You have to basically disconnect yourself and pull back from some of these areas that don't matter as much so that you can be so that you can give more in the areas that do matter the most in life. So in the area of of being criticized for uh, uh, something that you don't meet the expectations of others in life, remember, sometimes it's a performance thing. Sometimes you don't like it anyway. Move on. You know, uh, it's a misalignment. Just just say, hey, that's not for me, and move on. And then sometimes we have to just... uh, we just have to back away from things that don't matter as much so we can give more attention to the things that really do matter as much. All right, so that's the end of that little seminar right there. Everybody, everybody still all right? <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, Pastor, you're so mean. Oh, no. All right, so we'll go on. All right, so Mary finds herself locked into some uh, disappointing state, uh, situation in life, not for something that she didn't do, but for something that she did do. Because she comes in and she performs this tremendous act of worship, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, considered a very extravagant, maybe even overboard, maybe wasteful, uh, certainly inappropriate to the people that are around her. She's come in, and she's uh, butted right into, the, right into the, all of this uh, uh, men's time and men's meeting, and, 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 and she doesn't even ask about it. She doesn't make any statement about it. She just walks right in, and she just goes over, and she just starts doing her thing. Aristotle, the philosopher, said... Um, in order not to be criticized in life, you need to do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing. I don't know if you know that's where that came from or not. But let me just add to what Aristotle said. Uh, if you, if you uh, do nothing, say nothing, and be nothing, uh, you're going to get criticized for doing nothing and saying nothing and being nothing in life. Yeah, uh, people are going to criticize, right? Yeah, the only way that you're going to avoid being criticized by people in life and, and demonized and, and, uh, and, and second-guessed in life is, I guess, just be complacent and, uh, and mediocre in life. So here comes Mary. Mary comes into a room filled with important men at a super critical time. This is six days before Passover. This is not just some little uh, isolated meeting that's going. This is a very supercharged time. It's going to be about five days before Jesus is arrested. And, uh, and, and so it's a very spiritual and very anointed time. And she comes in uh, seemingly oblivious to all of the, all of the guys and all of the, the, the things that are around her. And she begins to perform this extravagant worship. So she comes in and she has this very expensive uh, ointment. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that she has a whole pound of this expensive ointment. A pound's a lot, isn't it? 16 ounces of stuff, pretty good amount of, pretty good amount of nard. That's probably, what, 10 ounces, something like that. She's got about 16 ounces of this stuff. It's from India, is what uh, the, the scholars tell us about this. Very expensive, uh, very costly. It's made for embalming people. It's made to, to be used at their death. So it's very appropriate to come in and to anoint somebody after they had passed away, but to come in before they pass away is uh, something that nobody that nobody does. And she comes in, and she breaks the cap off the thing or breaks the the bottle. You get the idea that whatever she does to it, she breaks it, and it can't be redone. So she's going to have to put the whole bottle. Uh, on him. She's not going to be able to put the cap back on and do it again. Now, just so you can kind of get the feel of what's going on here, think about this. Think about how much you make in a year. The Bible said it was worth 300 denarii. 300 denarii is, the, is a year's wages for the common person in the day of Jesus. A year's wages. All right. Think about how much you make in a year. All right, and think about spending everything that you make in a year on one particular item. And then you're going to come in and you're going to take that one particular item that you have spent an entire year's salary and you're going to break it and poof, it's going to be gone. And one year's salary and all of that expensive ointment is going to be gone at one little time. Now, can you feel that? I mean, can you feel how drastic that, that is? 
Well, everybody else in this story is in perfect character for what they're doing. Mar Martha is serving, which is what Martha does. Martha, um, this time Martha's, uh, she's not uh, complaining about things. You remember back in Luke 10, the first time she was serving at a supper, she started complaining about Mary not helping her, and Jesus said, well, Mary's chosen the best part, and that's not going to be taken away from her. Well, this time, Martha's not complaining to anybody, she, so she's developed and she's mature, and Lazarus is reclining at the table, and uh, of course he was. I don't know if you've recognized this, but every time you see Lazarus in the Bible, Lazarus is reclining. Uh, he's, uh, he's sick the first time you see him, so he's, he's, he's laying down. He's, uh, he's dead the next time you see him. So I'm, I'm assuming that he's lying down. You know, I've always thought, I've always wondered, how in the world did Lazarus come out of that tomb? I mean, did Lazarus just float out of the tomb? I mean, you know he had to just float out of the tomb because he's still wrapped up in all the ceremonial stuff that they wrapped the body up in because Jesus had to say, all right, loose him and let him go. So he's still wrapped up. And I'm just wondering if he came out you know, parallel, you know, to the ground like this, like he was laying down, or whether he came out, you know, kind of just floating out, standing up. But anyway, he is, uh, he is lying down. And, uh, and, and then, of course, now here at the table where we're seeing him, he's lying down, which uh, he's reclining at the table. So he's perfectly, uh, he's doing what he normally does. So Lazarus is at the late, Lazarus is in the lazy boy, and Martha's uh, serving, and Mary comes in. And she just pours out all the stuff that is uh, that would have been customary for something much later in life. But she just burst in and she pour, just uh, pours out her love and pours out her passion and pours out her ointment on Jesus. And and nobody in the room understands why she's done this. Nobody. She doesn't announce it. She doesn't tell them. She doesn't say anything about it. She just comes in and she just she just lays that out on Jesus' feet. And everybody in the room feels critical about her. Matthew talks about this miracle. Mark talks about this miracle. We're reading out of John. Matthew and Mark both tell us that most of the people in the room are unsettled by what she does. They, they don't understand. They, they begin to whisper, and why, why, has, why has this terrible waste been done? Why, has she, why, why would she break in to a group of men? This was completely socially inept and socially out of whack. And the only person in this room that doesn't have anything negative to say about Mary's act is Jesus. But, of course... No, he's the only one that matters. Why is that? Well, two reasons. One is because he's the Lord, obviously. And second, because the dinner, the supper was made in Jesus' honor. I mean, Martha, we appreciate you a lot. You are a great hostess. You serve a great meal. You know, you have made your home available, and we appreciate everything that you've done, but the, but the, but the dinner was not in Martha's honor. Lazarus, you're wonderful. Life's better with, with you here. We're glad that you've been resurrected. We're glad that, that, that you're back with us. But, but the dinner wasn't for Lazarus. But the dinner was given in Jesus' honor. And so the, the point here is when, when Jesus has the seat of honor, the objections of, those other, of others lose their weight. Jesus is pleased with Mary's act, and Jesus commends Mary's act as an act of worship. And because Jesus is the one who the dinner is made for, he's the, he's the one of honor, then his opinion is what really counts in life. Judas objected, but the dinner's not for Judas. Judas. Other people in the room were shocked and kind of taken back. This doesn't make sense. This is crazy. This is overboard spending, this disruption, uh, there aren't any women allowed. But the dinner was, was not made for them. The dinner was made for Jesus. And therefore, their words and their outrage don't matter uh, because her sacrifice was not for them. It was for Jesus. So here's what, 
Here's what we must do in life. We must clearly identify Jesus as the, as the guest of honor in every situation and in every conversation and every consideration in our life and watch what Jesus says about what, about what we do and the fact that Jesus speaks to us is what really matters in life because if Jesus is sitting on the seat of honor in our life, it's not what others think about what we do that matters. It's what Jesus thinks about what we do that matters. The word honor mean, is, the, is the Greek word kava. And the Greek word kava means weight. So in other words, if we allow Jesus' words to have weight in our life, then the other words that are spoken in our life don't affect us in that way. And I love the way John tells us that Jesus, uh, uh, has, uh, Jesus is worthy of honor in this situation because he told us, you know, that this was before we even started. He said, this is Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. Because the more you remember about what Jesus has done for you, the less you care about what people think about what you do for him. So Mary, in a sense, has arrived. She, she, she knows that this is uh, that there's a displeasure there. She knows, and she hears what people say. She just doesn't care about it because there's Jesus that she came to worship. And the fact that others didn't get what Mary have you ever noticed that people just don't get Mary, do they? I mean, in every situation, they they just don't they just don't get Mary. Mary somehow marches to the beat of a different drummer, and, and, and somehow they just don't understand Mary at all. And so Mary comes in, and Mary gives her best and pours her best out for Jesus because when Jesus is in the seat of honor, then nothing else that others think have anything to, to say to us. Let me give you this second principle real quick here. Look beneath the insult and see the mindset. When you're criticized by others for... Uh, for what you do in behalf of the Lord or to the Lord or in your spiritual life, look beneath the insult and see the mindset. Judas' argument was that all of this waste could have been sold and given to the poor. Now, that seems to be, on the surface, uh, a, a, very, a very notable thing, a very notable uh, uh, idea and concept to, that we want to serve others. But the real reason, according to the Scripture, that, G, that, that Judas did this was, according to the Scripture, not because he cared about the poor, but because he, he was a thief. And so sometimes the disappointment of others and the frustration of others is expressed toward us not because of what we did, but because of what they think. Judas expresses this displeasure with Mary, not because of the fact that she worshiped him, but because of the fact that he was a thief. And if they sold the money for what, if they sold the perfume for money, the money would be put in a bag and Judas would have what's put in the bag. And so many times we look at the criticism of others and understand that it's not our action that's being criticized, it's, it's their insecurities that are being exposed and not our actions. Remember, all the time you waste on Judas, you, 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 you could be worshiping Jesus. I want to give you, I, I read something that I, I really want to share with you that I think is very important about, about understanding where criticisms come from and actions because many times, it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with something else that's going on in life. Uh, I, I read this out of a, a, a magazine a long, long time ago, and I was really pleased that I was able to find it uh, on the Internet. One of the good things the Internet would be, <laughs> would be for. It's about a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm is, right? A paradigm is what you believe, what you think, how you act based on what you think and feel. Um, this was a this was a, a story shared uh, by a young man, and, and and it and it shows a lot of times that we have to look behind um, what is said to, uh, to to the actions that are are for are to the understandings that are behind something, and it really matters. It's not just the action; there's something behind that. Let me read it to you. I remember 
a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on a subway in New York. People were getting, were, were sitting quietly, some reading newspapers, some lost in thought, some resting with their eyes closed. It was a calm, peaceful scene. Then suddenly a man and his children entered the subway car. The children were so loud and rambunctious that instantly the whole climate changed. The man sat down next to me and closed his eyes, apparently oblivious to the situation. The children were yelling back and forth, throwing things, even grabbing people's papers. It was very disturbing, and yet the man sitting next to me did nothing. It was difficult not to feel irritated. I could not believe that he could be so insensitive to let, this, to let his children run wild like that and do nothing about it, taking no responsibility at all. It was easy to see that everyone else on the subway felt irritated too. So finally, with what I felt was an unusual patience and re restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you couldn't control them a little, a little more. The man lifted his gaze as, as if to come to a consciousness of the situation for the first time and said softly, Oh, oh you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. And I, I don't know what to think, and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Can you imagine what I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently. I felt differently. I behaved differently. My irritation vanished. I didn't have to worry about controlling my attitude or my behavior. My heart was filled with the man's pain. Feelings of sympathy and compassion flowed freely. Your wife just died? Oh, I'm so sorry. Can, can, is there anything I can do to help? Everything changed in an instant. Sometimes we need to look beneath the insult and see the mindset. Because it's impossible for us to read people's minds, right? We can't read those little thought bubbles that we have. And many times, the criticism that comes, us up, comes at us doesn't have anything to do with what we did, but everything to do with what's going on underneath the surface. So many times when I'm criticized for my love of the Lord, my giving of life, my devotion to Christ, my extravagance in my giving and life and devotion to Him, it's because my mindset is different. My mindset is to love Him and others have all kinds of motives and, and, and schemes and plans behind life. Let me give you just one other little thought uh, quickly uh, as a point of observation. The first time that we ever saw Mary in Luke chapter 10, you remember what she was doing? The Bible says that she, was, she had, they were, had, a serve, they had, a, they had a supper for Jesus and Mary and Martha were there and Lazarus was there and, and Martha was in the, kitchen serving and doing all the work and, and getting everything ready. And Mary, where was Mary? Mary was at the feet of Jesus listening. And Martha comes to Jesus and Martha says to Jesus, Jesus, tell my sister to help me because I'm doing all this stuff alone. And Jesus looked at her and Jesus said, Mary has chosen the best part and this shall never be taken away from her. It's interesting that here we see Martha again. And where is Martha? Martha's at the feet of Jesus. She's poured out this extravagant ointment on her. And she's taken her hair and wiped it off of his feet. Matthew and Mark tell us that this event started with the ointment being poured on Jesus' head. And I know that you know, you're saying, my goodness, what, you know, how, how is that? Well, remember, it's 16 ounces. 16 ounces is a lot, more than that, full of ointment. She poured it on Jesus' head, and just like anointing was done in the Bible, it was always done with a lot of ointment. When we anoint you in this altar, we take a little dab, and we put a little dab on our finger and maybe touch you or touch your hand. That, that, that's not the way they anointed in the Bible. 
The way they anointed in the Bible is they took the oil and they poured it on the head and it ran all the way down the body. When they anointed a high priest, it, it, it ran off the end of his robes and it had, they had little tassels at the bottom and, and the, little, uh, the junior priest would, 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 would get to the bottom of the high priest robe and they would catch the little anointments that dripped off there and they would put it on themselves. So that's the way the anointing happened. So Mark and, and Matthew tell us that as Mary anointed Jesus' head, the ointment ran down his body. And then John tells us by the time Mary gets there and Mary takes her hair, that, it's, that she's wiping it off of her feet. So now everything that has anointed Jesus is now back on Mary and the fragrance that, 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 uh, that anointed Jesus is now off on her and, she's at the feet of, and she is at the feet of Jesus. I've always found it interesting that the disciples, and maybe you have too, that the disciples had a, pro had a problem understanding what was going to happen to Jesus. It's always puzzled me that, you know, they had such a hard time dealing with the fact that Jesus told them everything about, the, about what was going to happen to him that he was going to be crucified, that they were going to come and take him, that he was going to die, but, but he wasn't going to stay dead. And three days later, he was going to rise again. And don't be afraid because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit back and he's going to comfort you and he's going to be with you. And, he, and, and it seems like at, when Jesus was arrested and then when they began, to, when they began to, to flog him and they began to abuse him and they began to uh, uh, chastise him and chasten him, that the disciples ran away. The disciples evacuated as if... They didn't have any idea that that was going to happen to Jesus. And yet, there was, at the cross, Mary was at the cross. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary, this Mary. And this Mary brought uh, the ointment early in the morning. In other words, she was totally prepared for everything that Jesus was going to go through. And I thought, why would this be so? And it was because, I think, that, G that Mary spent time at Jesus' feet listening to what Jesus had to say in life. Those guys were busy doing the work of the ministry, and they had a lot of things going, and, and they just didn't listen to Jesus like Mary did. So in our life with the Lord, these criticisms of life, these frustrations of life, these things are solved at the feet of Jesus by, by sitting and listening to what Jesus says at his feet. And Jesus will prepare us for what happens in life and what lies ahead for us.